you are listening to Hungry Books, a podcast about the best books ever written on the subject of food. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook, and author. And each episode, I present a book that will change your life. Consuming food is one of the most basic needs we have to fulfill to ensure our survival. And from our birth, we are forced into an existence that revolves around food. Some people may say that we accommodate eating into our lives, but really, we accommodate our lives around solving our need to source and prepare our food. Ironically, these Dependence of us to satisfy every day the bodily need to eat might be the reason why food was for centuries considered as not enough complex subject or elevated enough to be addressed from the heights of intellectual disciplines. We know now that food plays a big social, cultural, economic and even political role in our lives, but it wasn't always this way. The rise of food studies started as a sort of counter-revolution from within the humanities and social disciplines, who finally turned their attention towards the human experience, the social constructs of meanings and relationships that we create around food, and realized that our sensory perception is profoundly linked to all these aspects. The book featured in this episode is Making Sense of Taste, Food and Philosophy, which is now considered a classic and was written by Carolyn Korsmeyer, who changed the convention of not writing about taste in the classical way that philosophy does, that is by focusing on the cultural aspects of what class, gender, ideology, etc. defined as taste, as a value. She actually goes on to make philosophy about the way we create meaning with the information we get when we consume food. Now, I am aware that we seldom put philosophy and food in the same sentence, but think of this book as an exercise in exploring how our ideas about the world, reality, and our own existence begin with the way we physically experience the world. Because our senses are indeed the strongest connection that we have with this wonderful world that we live in. So have at hand something to tingle your taste buds and on with the show. So how about we start the episode with a quick review of what this book offers and what makes it so special. Making Sense of Taste, Food and Philosophy was originally published in 1999, but it has aged remarkably well, considering that Korsmeyer pioneered the crossover between history, philosophy, anatomy and gastronomy, which of course meant that the book had to be carefully organized to accommodate all these many perspectives. She begins by exploring the earliest concepts about the body that emerged in the Western cultures, which takes us back all the way to ancient Greece, when thinkers became intrigued by the way the senses work. But, fascinated as they were by the human body, they considered its functions as mechanical and almost involuntary. So, figures like Plato and Aristotle dismissed almost completely the body and its needs as inferior subjects of study. So pretty much that's when it all started downhill for the study of the senses. Later on, we are introduced to the creation of the concept of aesthetics, which was invented during the period known as the Enlightenment in the 18th century, which occurred in different parts of Europe, namely in France. This movement came up with the idea of, quote-unquote, taste as a way to categorize the way we value things, creations, and experiences. And they considered 
tasteful, all those things that in their eyes and values were beautiful, virtuous and aspirational. On the other hand, discussions about the nature and purpose of the senses in our body have also been at the center of passionate discussions about the dangers they pose. Dangers, you wonder? Yes. So, we see that at many points in history, philosophy and religions, Christianity in particular, have seen the senses as a gateway for temptation and put virtue at risk. On the other hand, the earliest arguments that science came up with to explain specifically the sense of taste were almost exclusively focused on the idea that its evolutionary purpose was only to help us distinguish the edible from the poisonous and nothing else. So that didn't really help to further the discussion. And thankfully, the author introduces us to what psychology, once a young experimental science, contributed to our understanding of taste. And this mention is very important because while psychology studies the human mind and behavior, it actually borrows many explanations from physiology to explain the mechanisms through which our body collects information from the world through our senses, meaning what we see, what we listen, what we taste and what we feel. And all this information is fed into our brain where our intellect and emotions make sense of what we perceive. And that is how we create memorable experiences with all of these elements. And what's so useful about that, you may wonder? Well, as the author beautifully puts it in philosophical terms, what we perceive through our sense of taste can be so strong that can provoke an aesthetic sublimation. The kind you might feel when admiring a painting that moves you to tears or music that elevates your spirit. My favorite part of the book is almost at the end, where the author gives us a masterclass in the way food has been depicted in painting and how artists over the centuries have used visual representations to provoke specific reactions in the observer and even hint symbolisms and coded messages. Think of foods and fruits presented in voluptuous and sensual ways and they can be depicted alone or as part of a composition where people interact with these foods in an almost erotic way. Other genre of painting, known as still life, depicts foods, drinks, cooking ingredients and other objects to present different conceptions of wealth and abundance or scarcity and poverty. And in the same way, scenes depicting feasts or the enjoyment of food have historically been used to represent social hierarchies. So in this part of the book, the author analyzes the way food has been used in art to communicate sublime and spiritual symbols, as well as representing transgression and profanity. Some examples of this can be religious paintings in which food can represent certain aspects of the divine, like the Christian communion, or artworks that communicate carnal desire, gluttony and indulgence. The book closes with a series of reflections about gustatory semantics, which is a fancy philosophical concept to explain that food can be used to create a language, one that offers representations, symbolisms and metaphors. And perhaps the most striking revelation that I found in this last section of the book is when the author explains that eating involves the poignant paradox that we are forced to destroy other forms of life in order to exist. And the philosophical implications of just that act of destroying life to maintain life can indeed keep us looking for existential meaning for centuries to come. So I mentioned that the book was published in 1999 and back then it ruffled a lot of feathers. It attracted a fair amount of criticism for daring, lowering philosophy to be in first terms with science, art, psychology and even physiology. But in my opinion, a sign of a good work is one that upsets the status quo. And the author is all too familiar with that. 
Dr. Caroline Korsmeyer is a leading philosopher at Buffalo State University of New York, and she was president of the American Society of Aesthetics, and her research work has always navigated the gray areas that go from philosophy, emotions, and feminism. Making Sense of Taste, Food, and Philosophy is actually the first of three books she has written on the subject of food. She also authored The Taste Culture Reader, Experiencing Food and Drink, Sensory Formations, and Savoring Disgust, The Foul and the Fair in Aesthetics. So a very simple way to explain the relationship between philosophy and taste is that we must see our sensory perception the same way we understand knowledge. The more of it we acquire and the more experiences we have, the richer and deeper our understanding of the world and ourselves will be. Well, that was just a super quick read into the feast that this book offers. So I have put together some of my favorite passages and I sort of organize them in a parallel way to the chapters of the book. So here we go. For many of us, the first introduction to philosophy in the Western world came with the study of ancient Greek thinkers. And <laughs> I don't know about you, but my high school memories are a bit hazy. It really took me oy, more than 10 years to go back to philosophy when I was in college. The book introduces us to the views of Aristotle and Plato, who seem to be at the root of our biased opinion about the senses. Because for them, it seemed almost a tragedy that our minds were oppressed by the distracting needs of our bodies. And to give them some credit, the Greeks were very intense folk. and They spent huge amounts of time wondering about the reason of our existence and attempting to explain the purpose and meaning of life, coming up with elaborate and often weird but imaginative answers to explain how our bodies work. Aristotle and Plato were pretty obsessed with making a distinction between the body parts they deemed as superior to others. For example, they excluded the head from the rest of the body as they allocated the ability of reasoning and thinking within the head. Therefore, it was more important than the rest. And for Plato specifically, he saw life as an ongoing battle to transcend the tyranny of the body in order to free our intellect. Or as he put it, a philosopher must not be concerned with neither food nor drink nor sex. Mm, you can see how problematic and hard it is to follow these principles. Actually, that just reminded me of a radical group of um, Greek philosophers, which are not mentioned in the book, but they are oddly relevant. So these were the Pythagoreans, and they believed that the body and soul functioned together. And they were the ones who coined the concept of healthy mind in healthy body. They refused to eating meat because of the violent means to obtain it. Fair point. But they also wouldn't eat beans because they believed that evil spirits lived in them and that flatulence was clear evidence of their malevolent nature. <laughs> the point is that the Greek school of thought gave us many gifts, but also ruined our relationship with our bodies for centuries to come, because it took us thousands of years to fully understand and study our senses without this bias of what is important and what is not. Many centuries later, after the Greeks, during the so-called Age of Reason, or the Enlightenment, occurred the rise of aesthetics, which is a branch of philosophy that, like I said at the top of the show, tries to explain and define beauty and virtue in art. Now, because all forms of art are perceived through our senses, aesthetics came up with the idea that by using a combination of our physical perception, our emotional, moral and intellectual responses, we can achieve sublime 
and even spiritual experiences as a response to beautiful and virtuous things. So when we are overcome with emotion, when we listen to a beautiful symphony or we admire a painting, well, that for them is a sign of good taste, meaning of educated and virtuous minds and souls that answer to the beauty and perfection that is in front of them. Now, let me unpack that. Of course, this has many class implications of the time. And I'm not going to discuss that now, because what I'm really interested is in the way aesthetics neglected the sense of taste and the alleged inability to produce elevated experiences. But why did I think that? The author uses the example of how Kant, a German philosopher of the 18th century, was very tortured trying to settle the debate about whether taste, as a conceptual category, is a rational function of the mind. That is, that we decide rationally that something is beautiful. Or, he thought, maybe is a sentiment born from the experience of what we perceive with our bodies. Meaning, maybe what we see or what we listen is so beautiful that we react with emotion rather than with reason and logic. So Kant, like many of his contemporaries, carried on the Greek tradition of considering beauty and virtue as something pure and untouched, unspoiled, and that only truly virtuous people are able to appreciate these values, which uh, is complete nonsense because, for starters, there isn't a universal consensus across cultures about what defines beauty or virtue. But thankfully, the author doesn't spend too much time dealing with Kant and instead pushes the discussion into the 1960s, when modern French philosopher Pierre Bourdieu told everyone that we were getting it all wrong and that our alleged ability to decide what to hold as virtuous and beautiful is not a spiritual quality, but rather the result of education and life experiences. Simple as that. Meaning that what we consider individually as tasteful or distasteful is actually defined by our social background, ideologies, and rather shockingly, by the advertisement industry. Pierre Bourdieu removed all mysticism from philosophy and insisted that to understand the nature of people and societies, we must begin with studying the institutions that shape individuals that is, schools, religion, political parties, and so on. You get the idea. Because those are institutions that create social differences, labels, divisions, and shape our beliefs. For Bourdieu, society shapes the way we think, the way we act, and forces us to reproduce those same structures. And the category of taste is a key element to distinguish the people who, quote-unquote, have taste and discriminate the people who don't have it. One of the things that I found really, really useful in this book is how the author invites us to reach out to other disciplines and areas of knowledge to support our arguments or even just to question if our assumptions about certain things might be the wrong ones. I think too often we become trapped in silos, working, reading, and talking to people in our same sector, and we miss out the chance to enrich our perspectives by listening to what others have to say. And if you think of it, history is full of examples of brilliant people, underdogs, transgressors, dropouts and career changers who went on to do amazing things once they stepped out of their comfort zone. And that is certainly the case of Jean Antel Briand Savarin. It is commonly assumed that Savarin was a cook because, well, he's mostly famous for writing about gastronomy. And although he was a man of many talents and occupations, a cook he was not. Jean Antelme 
was born in 1755 and was said to follow the family tradition to become a lawyer. And not only he studied law, he also read chemistry, medicine, spoke five languages, including Latin and Greek, and played the violin. <laughs> he actually went on to have a political career, and rather shockingly, he was a fervent supporter of the capital punishment. Savarin even became an elected mayor of his natal city of Belay. But in the bitter end of the French Revolution, he fled from Switzerland to the Netherlands and ended up as a first violin player using his own Stradivarius at the Park Theatre in New York, of all places. And many years later, at the end of his life, he was revered as the world's first philosopher of food. But how did this happen? Well, let's see. Now, I told you that Jean Antel had to escape France. And when he was finally able to return, after playing the violin in America, by the end of the 1700s, he had already become an experienced man of the world. And he was hired to manage for the catering logistics for the troops of General Augereau. I think that's how you say it. <laughs> who had supported the French Revolution. And afterwards, Savarin was appointed for life as head of the Court of Criminal Justice in Versailles. In 1808, Napoleon named Savarin Chevalier de l'Empire for his services to the nation. At the age of 70, Jean Antelm published a book that took him decades to write and was entirely financed by himself. The title? Well, Physiologie de goût ou méditation de gastronomie transcendante, ouvrage théorique, historique, est à l'ordre du jour dédié au gastronome parisien par un professeur, membre de plusieurs sociétés littéraires et savantes. Or in plain English, The philosophy of taste or meditations on transcendental gastronomy a theoretical, contemporary and historical work dedicated to Parisian gastronomes by a professor, member of several literary and scholarly societies. Savarin's book contains every argument possible to create the foundation of gastronomy and the culinary practice as art. After all, he was a lawyer and a bon vivant of very expensive tasters, and he was very, very, very French, of course. Jean Antelm wrote this book precisely during the height of the aesthetic discussions about taste that I told you earlier during the Enlightenment. But unlike hardcore thinkers like Kant, Savarin was surprisingly pragmatic about taste because he insisted that anyone, not only rich people, could be educated into expanding and learning about taste and that it was ridiculous to think that virtuous people are born with the natural ability to navigate towards beauty and sophistication. He insisted on the need to educate Everyone gave the equal chance to access intellectual skills and sensory experiences in order to be able to differentiate between what is ordinary and what is extraordinary. Now, for us, this might seem as obvious thinking, but back then, this was rather revolutionary because what he was actually saying is that taste was not defined by what a king or an upper-class chef would say, but rather by the quality of the ingredients and the skills to make the most of them. This book is a declaration of war against aristocracy. If you read Savarin now, it might take you a while to get used to his style and might even come across as rather obnoxious. But bear in mind that throughout his life, Savarin was a through and through gourmand, meaning someone who really, really enjoys food and all the pleasures that come with it. But I would agree that he was, well, kind of pedantic, fussy and snobbish. But you know, it was pretty much how everyone wrote back then. And well, had he not been a genius, 
mm, we wouldn't still be talking about him 194 years later after his death. Savarin's brilliant book became incredibly memorable because it combines science, theory and history with appetite, drink, sex and pleasure. He introduces the idea that sexual desire is the main driver of our endless pursuit for sensory pleasures. And of course, sometime later, Freud's own works on the psychoanalytic sexual drive will prove him just right. One of my favorite rabbit holes in the book is the idea of food as a source of enjoyment and pleasure, of course evidently delivered to the body via our sense of taste. In fact, many philosophers, modern and past, have made some attempts to consider food as an art form, even if for them it's a very humble form of art. Which leads me to the question, why should we consider food as an art form anyway? Well, the author explains that since foods can be carefully planned and presented, organized in sequence to be experienced in a certain way, well, that pretty much contains all the right elements to provoke in us an aesthetic experience. This very point has been very problematic for many authors that can't decide where to stand about that. Some thinkers have suggested that food can't be compared to the enduring beauty of a symphony, poems or paintings. And what they mean by that is that food has limitations that keep it from being proper art. They argue that one of these limitations is that food has a very short existence and it can't be replicated in the same way. But you see how the same argument can be applied to a symphonic performance or a painting. They simply can't be duplicated in the exact same way. In the case of food, while recipes can endure the test of time and can be shared across generations, the dishes themselves are destroyed when we eat them. But I think that the sting really comes with the last argument that for many philosophers, food cannot express emotion. And while a cook may express feelings in the act of cooking, food, they say, cannot move us in the same way that great art can. Mm, what do you think about that? Now, if we step outside of the realms of philosophy and peek inside archaeology, we find that food has been represented in art since ancient times. We can see examples in cave paintings, Egyptian inscriptions, pre-Columbian pottery, Renaissance frescoes, and even post-modern paintings of Campbell's soup cans. <laughs> the author also reminds us that throughout history we have created foods to represent very specific things. Two good examples of these are pretzels that symbolize the act of prayer and what to say about the representation of the Austrian triumph over the Ottoman Empire in the croissant and the very violent metaphor of what it means to eat this pastry. But the creation and use of foods can even have a high spiritual value and serve religious purposes too, like the metaphysical allegory of intricate Mexican sugar skulls and their place at the Day of the Dead altars that reminds us of our own mortality, but also symbolize the way we treasure the memory of our loved ones that have died. What this shows is that food can be actually incredibly more complex than art itself. Because food can carry many messages that we can perceive and experience in a simultaneous way through our different senses. And it all culminates in a communion when we consume all these edible symbols. Food is a perfect conduit to express and signal many, many meanings, and it's no surprise to also see food represented in literature, where food is used as a metaphor to express the desires of the characters in a story. And the author points us to folk tales. Think of Beowulf and how Grendel and his mother kill and literally eat 
Englishmen out of despise and revenge, or how Snow White is poisoned with an apple by her stepmother to force her disappearance. In some other cases in literature, food can also represent what it is desired as much as what it is forbidden, and the act of eating becomes the ultimate transgression. In theater, food has also been used to represent cultural divides and hierarchies. Think of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, when Shylock expresses his offense to Bassanio's insults by saying, I will buy with you, see with you, talk with you but I will not eat with you, drink with you, and I will not pray with you. I read this book 15 years after it was first published, and I still find myself thinking about it simply because I still very much find it deeply valuable. And what I've tried to present here for you is really a series of snapshots to illustrate just a few of the many ways in which philosophy, and this book in particular, can help us think in different directions, see ourselves, our bodies, and our senses under a different light. Now, let me give you my five reasons why I think you should read this book. Number one. It seems that we have finally embraced the fact that we aren't machines of reason, but individuals whose existence is determined by our emotions, perceptions, and the cultural factors that have shaped us. We have also come to understand that food is so much more than just fuel, and that we are not only what we eat, but also what we experience when we eat. The book reminds us that, from an evolutionary point of view, we have had to learn to trust our senses in order to survive, but we have also retrained ourselves to find pleasure and enjoyment through them. Number two. In a subtle way, we are also reminded that throughout history, we have also abused, depraved, and perverted, and even weaponized taste in both senses, the cultural categories of tasteful and distasteful, and the sensory perceptions. And while it's not literally mentioned in the book, it really invites us to meditate about this. Think about how the food industry has lied to us by deliberately creating food-like substances that aren't nutritious, but make us believe that we are eating something good. We use food to bribe children into behaving, and we even use against ourselves when we abuse it and deny ourselves the pleasure and enjoyment of it. Number three. I find modern silos of knowledge sterile and absurd, which is why I think the author's choice to challenge the obsolete opinions about taste is very refreshing, a valuable lesson indeed, especially today when our structures of power and systems of belief have failed us spectacularly. One of the greatest virtues of the human mind is our ability to question assumptions and structures, and this is a reminder to never give up on that ability. 4. Taste, more than any other sense, in my opinion, is so heavily charged with memory, emotion and desire I created a food tour here in my hometown of Puebla, Mexico, in which I combine foods with social and culinary history of my city. Very often, I have clients of Mexican-American ancestry, and I have really lost count of how many times grown men and women have to take a moment to recover as they find themselves overwhelmed with emotions and memories of their grandmothers, friends, their childhood, and God knows how many more experiences they have all at once when they eat or drink a familiar food that they haven't had in years. So if you ask me if taste plays a big role in our lives, the answer is a big, big yes, absolutely. Taste is arguably the most evocative and powerful of all the senses. And last, number five, I want to say in all honesty, that this is not a light reading, and I really had to work very hard to write this episode. This book will make you think. Read more, dig in other books, and honestly, if a book doesn't pick your brain, well, why bother reading it? I firmly believe 
that we have the right and the duty to have opinions about things, and even more so about our own existence, our minds, our bodies, our choices. Yes, our dependence on food to survive is exactly the same for the rich and for the poor, for the artist, the scientist, the rabbi, the cobbler, and we should all reclaim our right to educate ourselves, read more about it, and share our opinions and views with others. Oh, I hope this episode had kept the juices of your foodie souls going. I, for one, got all excited about it again. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode that was written and produced with much passion by me, Rocio Carvajal. Remember that in the notes of the episode on your podcast app, you can find the link to get this book, Making Sense of Taste, Food and Philosophy by Carolyn Korsmeyer. And I will also put a link to Savarin's book. <laughs> Remember, you can reach out to me on social media. Send me an email to hello at pasachipotle.com. So... I think that's it for today, my friends. Stay hungry. <laughs>